Uh, our next speaker today is Professor Valentin Wittmann uh, from University of Konstanz, Germany. Uh, Professor Wittmann research interests involve in chemical biology of carbohydrates, metabolic glycoengineering, investigation of multivalent carbohydrate protein interactions, development of ligation reactions, glycopeptide synthesis, and RNA targeting antibiotics. And he'll be speaking today on the precipitation free high affinity multivalent lectin bindings. Thank you, uh, Professor Valentin Wittmann. Uh, please start your talk uh, to the audience. Thank you. Sir, you are not audible. <laughs> Sir, we cannot hear. We no, we cannot hear you, sir. No, 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 cannot hear. Sir, some noise is coming, but it is not audible. I might suggest, um, Tino, that maybe you, you turn off your, um, or you mute your audio there and maybe speak into your, your, your phone through the, um, maybe that might work if we can connect that way. There is some issue of listening. It is not audible. Uh, sir, can you use the headphones if you have? Professor Anil. Okay, so now uh, a second try. Does it work now? Very nice. Perfect. Okay. It's okay, so nice. I just okay. exited uh, Zoom and, and uh, entered again. So that was yeah. uh, the solution. Okay, now I try to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. we can we see do. it. Very good. Okay, I go to the... Uh, 
to the uh, presentation in full. Okay. Good. Okay, and uh, can you also see the laser pointer? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, okay. So sorry for these uh, technical uh, issues. Um, now, uh, first, I would like to thank you very much for the uh, invitation to give this talk here uh, at this uh, e-seminar. Um, thank you very much for setting this up. It is now half a year ago that we met in, in Lucknow uh, for this very nice meeting here in, in your lecture hall. Uh, uh, in the meantime, the world has changed. Yeah? And so it is not so easy anymore to meet uh, in, in presence. And so, therefore, uh, I'm very happy that you organized this, this online meeting. Um, so many thanks uh, again for, for this. Now, today I would like to talk about uh, carbohydrate-lectin uh, interactions. And uh, uh, lectins are uh, carbohydrate-recognizing uh, molecules you know, or proteins, uh, and uh, these um, uh, uh, carbohydrate lectin interactions are very important uh, for the control of many biological events. Uh, some of them occur on cell surfaces, and there they are, uh, among many others, um, uh, responsible, for example, for the viral and bacterial adhesion to host cells. And so, what you can see here on the left hand side is a uh, a picture of, uh, of a HIV uh, envelope uh, glycoprotein where you can see that this protein is highly glycosylated and um, uh, also the coronavirus uh, proteins are also very heavily glycosylated. Uh, and um, we have heard that uh, just in the previous talk and uh, it is obviously of great value if we would be able to inhibit such um, lectin carbohydrate interactions in order to control uh, such processes, for example, the viral adhesion uh, to host cells. Uh, now, um, in order to be able to inhibit um, these interactions, we have to understand them. And so the, um, okay, it doesn't work for the, and uh, in order to, um, uh, yeah, to, to, to develop high affinity ligands for uh, lectins, we need a mechanistic uh, understanding uh, of the processes that are going on. And so my talk will be a bit about the mechanistic investigation of carbohydrate lectin interactions. And uh, a common feature of such carbohydrate lectin interactions is that the binding affinity of uh, lectins to carbohydrate ligands is usually quite low. Uh, that means uh, we have typically KD values in the milli to micromolar range, uh, and that is often not uh, enough to achieve a high affinity binding that is necessary for, for inhibition of such interactions. And uh, nature uses a principle, and that is multivalency, uh, in order to, to overcome the problem of low affinity. So what uh, means multivalency? Uh, multivalency is the simultaneous interaction of um, um, several ligands of one biological unit, which can be a surface or, or a macromolecule, with several uh, receptors of a second um, biological unit. And in this way, we obtain a strongly increased binding affinity uh, in, in carbohydrate chemistry. It's also called the glycoside cluster effect. Uh, in biology in general, we talk about avidity in, in that sense. And this, um, as I said, leads to a strongly increased um, affinity, but also selectivity uh, can be increased. And one effect that is um, made responsible um, for, for this gain in affinity is the chelate effect. So if we have a protein with uh, two binding sites and we have a, a carbohydrate ligand that can then bridge these binding sites, it is possible to achieve a high, um, yeah, you, you gain a lot of uh, binding affinity by this chelate effect. And some years ago, um, Roland Peters, who is the next speaker today, and me, we have summarized that in this uh, review article. 
Um, however, there are also cases where a chelate binding mode is not possible, for example, because the binding sites uh, of a protein are too far away in order to bridge them by a, um, um, by a multivalent ligand. Uh, and now there is the observation that even in such cases, we obtain a strongly increased binding affinity with such a multivalent ligand. And that shows that the situation ob obviously is much more complicated uh, and that we um, um, yeah, also do not fully understand what is going on during multivalent interactions. And that was our motivation to step into the field uh, and when we started many years ago, we decided to use a model lectin. Um, and um, um, why did we choose this molecule? At the time that we started, there was a crystal structure of the protein known. However, there was no crystal structure available with bound carbohydrates. So it was not completely clear where the carbohydrate binding sites are located. Um, and, and the structure that you can see here uh, is a structure that we solved. Um, and, and this um, lectin uh, consists um, uh, as a stable dimer binding sites. Uh, there are four so-called primary binding sites um, that are shown here uh, on the on the uh, front side of the molecule, they have a higher binding affinity and on the back side that we cannot see in this um, picture here, there are so-called four so-called secondary binding sites that have a lower affinity. Each of the binding sites can bind to an acetyl glucosamine or in short glucnac or also oligomers thereof. Um, uh, and uh, when, when we started our research, um, we first wanted to yeah, um, find affinity, uh, uh, multivalent ligands that bind to the protein with a high affinity. Uh, and so we started with a combinatorial approach. So we used glycopeptides, where we had a cyclic peptide core structure that served as a scaffold to present carbohydrates on the um, uh, in, in, on the in the side chains of these uh, molecules. And in this way, we were able to achieve multivalent molecules that differ in, the, um, uh, in, 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 the, in their structure. And so we had a, a library with a spatial diversity. And from screening of these structures, we identified um, a number of high affinity multivalent ligands. Among them is this tetravalent glycopeptide. And if you compare the binding affinity of this tetravalent glycopeptide, which is 8 nanomolar, that is more than 200,000 fold better than the monovalent interaction, which is simply glucnac, which is in the millimolar range. And so this was a, a an, 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 um, remarkable uh, um, yeah, um, uh, increase in binding affinity. And so we uh, wanted to understand how this binding uh, affinity is indeed in, uh, increased. So the first idea was, okay, we have four sugars, maybe they simultaneously interact with the four binding sites of the protein, and in this way leading to the high affinity. So what we then did in the following, we did uh, X-ray crystallography. We were able, for example, to solve the structure of uh, the wheat germ agglutinin in complex with such divalent uh, ligands. And here you can, uh, then we were able to see for the first time such a bridging of binding sites um, uh, in, in this protein. And now we were able to identify all eight binding sites of the protein. So this was an important um, uh, result. Later on, then we uh, developed a method where we used um, spin-labeled carbohydrate derivatives in order to investigate the mechanism of these interactions. So by using um, EPR spectroscopy, it is possible to determine distances. Uh, and this allows us to um, distinguish, for example, such a bridging binding mode or such a two plus one uh, complex formation.
Uh, and when we carried out these experiments, we also um, realized that it is possible to use just monovalent uh, nitroxide containing carbohydrate ligands that you can titrate on a multivalent protein and then determine distances between the binding sites. And in this way, you could use an, a, a protein of unknown structure and um, um, uh, identify or measure the distances between the binding sites. Yeah? Now, in this uh, molecule, there is a flexibility in the, in the linkage between the nitroxide and the carbohydrate, which leads to, um, yeah, to broad lines in these distance distributions. Therefore, we further on developed um, stiff uh, uh, compounds where we have a C glycoside uh, here, and now uh, the position of the nitroxide. Now, here with these uh, precision. Uh, probes, we can get really um, very clear or very sharp distances between binding sites. Okay, and now to make a long story short, um, what is the reason that this tetravalent glycopeptide has such a high affinity? We could show by a combination of many different um, uh, analytical approaches that um, it is a combination of um, uh, a precipitation of uh, proteins. So we get um, uh, large uh, aggregates that precipitate, but then also in, within solution, such three plus three complexes uh, can form, um, uh, as you can see here, uh, and, uh, and, and a combination of all these um, yeah, uh, binding mechanisms leads to the high affinity of this um, ligand. Um, now at that point you can also see a common feature of multivalent interactions, uh, which is the fact that we often observe precipitation Arthur. of uh, proteins uh, by uh -huh. uh, such yeah. multivalent ligands. Uh, and um, this is, of course, uh, something that can be a severe disadvantage if you think about a multivalent compound mm -hmm. uh, that you want to use as, um, um, mm -hmm. as a drug. Mm -hmm. So um, our next idea was then to, um, uh, yeah, to develop ligands that can bind with a very high affinity, but that do not lead to the precipitation mm -hmm. of a protein. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, and as you can see here, that is a common design of multivalent ligands um, that is used um, uh, throughout literature. Uh, and in all these cases, uh, you uh, uh, observe more or less always uh, precipitation of uh, proteins. And so um, then we thought, how can we come up with a carbohydrate ligand that binds to a protein, to a multivalent protein, without um, leading to precipitation. And the idea came uh, when my co-worker Philipp Rose had a closer look at the crystal structure of wheat germ glutamine in complex with this divalent ligand. Yeah, here you can see uh, two binding sites that are bridged by this uh, divalent ligand. Um, and, and here are two other binding sites that are bridged by a second molecule of a divalent ligand. And Philip realized that uh, within this structure, two of the OH groups of the carbohydrates, uh, namely the six uh, positions uh, yeah, of both carbohydrates are not involved uh, in, in binding to the protein. These uh, residues also point away from the protein. And um, uh, so they can be modified uh, without losing binding affinity. And so his idea was to connect these two by a linker and in this uh, way, <coughs> we obtain a tetravalent compound um, uh, 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 in, in which the inner carbohydrates are part of the yes, uh, backbone structure of this multivalent compound. And so this is a new type of uh, design. So now we do not have any more these um, star shaped molecules or these dendrimers, but here uh, the inner carbohydrates are yeah, in line with the, the whole structure. And that is why we call these inline lactin ligands or in short, ILEX. And so um, 
uh, it is clear that if um, the, the linker has the correct length so that we can um, bridge this gap between the two OH groups, then we would achieve a, a, a multivalent ligand that can wrap around the protein and this should lead to a very high binding affinity and it should not lead to precipitation of the protein. Now the question of course was how long does this linker have to be and you can calculate that and we calculated that we need at least 10 ethylene glycol units in order to, to bridge the gap between the two um, um, uh, OH groups. And so Philip um, synthesized a whole series of, of these ILEX where he varied the length of this central linker uh, between a 6 and 12 uh, ethylene glycol units. And now we can see that um, the compounds with uh, 6, 7 or 8 or 9 units uh, are too short, even in a, in a very stretched form. It is not possible to link uh, this bridge, uh, this gap, uh, whereas uh, the longer ones that are marked here in green, they are able uh, to, to bridge the gap between the two binding sites. And so Philip uh, carried out binding uh, um, uh, experiments, so by using isothermal titration calorimetry, and he determined the, the KD values of all the compounds. And so, of course, you don't need to read the whole table, but just have a look at the KD values. Here you can see that all the compounds are in the low nanomolar range, with a, which is a very uh, high affinity and, and uh, uh, unprecedented uh, affinity for, for such uh, compounds. Uh, and this is about six orders of magnitude better than, than Glucknack itself. Um, um, uh, but astonishingly, also the, co the compounds where the central linker is too short to bridge the two binding sites, even these compounds have a quite high binding affinity, although this is lower than the one for, for the green compounds. Um, what you can also uh, see from uh, these experiments is the stoichiometry of the binding that is shown here in this column. So what you can see here is that the ratio between ligand and protein, and in protein we always count the, the, the dimeric um, protein, we see a stoichiometry of one in all cases. So that means one ligand binds to one protein molecule, dimer, protein molecule, dimer. Uh, and uh, that was also very interesting because um, here we know that uh, these, um, uh, um, uh, uh, the linkers in these compounds uh, is too short uh, it, to, to um, lead to a binding mode that I sketched in the slide before. However, from the delta H values, yeah, they are all quite similar. We know that all four carbohydrates are indeed involved in protein binding. And that um, um, yeah, um, questions how the binding mode of these short molecules would be. So obviously there must be an intermolecular binding, so a bridging of, um, of protein molecules. And so, of course, then at that point, um, um, uh, we were interested to see whether uh, protein precipitation occurs. However, before I show you these uh, experiments, uh, we, we were also wondering why the difference between these, uh, the, the, the short linkers and the long linkers uh, in affinity is not so high. Uh, and so uh, it is known that uh, ITC has its, uh, let's say, um, um, you, know, ca you cannot use it to measure um, binding affinities that are lower usually in the, than the nanomolar range. Uh, and so we thought, okay, we, we perform um, a different type of assay and we uh, carried out competition experiments. So um, what we did, we pre-incubated our protein with uh, a high concentration, 10 millimolar of glucnac as a competitor, and then carried out uh, our ITC experiments again. And now you can see a comparison of the standard ITC. So these are the KD values you have seen on the last slide yeah, for uh, one of the ILEX with the shortest and the one with the longest linker. Uh, and now here on the right hand side, you can see uh, the results of this competitive ITC experiments. 
Whereas here, the difference or is, is roughly a factor of two. Now here we have uh, a factor of 10. Uh, and uh, then we also um, uh, um, investigated another glycopeptide that we synthesized previously, uh, which also had an affinity that was quite high, in that case, seven nanomolar. However, under these competition experiments, now the, the KD is much higher. So um, what that shows is that our new ligand design is especially valuable if you have such competitive um, conditions. Okay, now let's come to the question whether these compounds lead to protein precipitation. And um, so to invest investigate that, we carried out the following experiment. We took um, uh, Eppendorf tubes and we dissolved our protein and then we added um, our ligands uh, uh, at the concentrations uh, or at the uh, um, at, at a different stoichiometries. And then uh, we incubated this solution, uh, centrifuged it, and determined uh, the, um, the solution of the supernatant. So in, in this way, we were able to quantify the amount of protein that had been precipitated, that could be um, the precipitate that could be removed by centrifugation. And if you now have a look at the results obtained with our ILEX, so again here the one with the uh, shortest linker and the one with the longest linker, uh, and we try to trade it up to three equivalents of our ligand to the protein, and you see that we never observe precipitation. So not with a uh, compound with a longer linker and even not with a uh, compound of the sh with the shortest uh, linker. Uh, just as a comparison, um, so we can rule out precipitate formation. Uh, just for a comparison, we also tested this um, uh, glycopeptide that we uh, reported earlier. And here you can see that uh, we obtain up to 20% of precipitation all the times with an excess of the ligand. So clearly our new design does not lead to protein precipitation. But then still the question is, how is the binding mode of these um, compounds with a short central linker? Because we know uh, all sugars are involved in binding uh, and, and they cannot bind to four binding sites of a single protein. So therefore, uh, we carried out dynamic light scattering, um, uh, which is a technique to detect soluble aggregates of proteins. And now what you can see here is the distribution of hydrodynamic radii of the pure protein. And now if we titrate um, our uh, ligands onto it, uh, we observe an increase in the hydrodynamic radius, um, um, meaning that some sort of aggregate is forming. And that is the case if we use the compounds with the short central linker. If we use the compound with a long linker, then we did not observe an increase in the molecular weight. And then you can quantify this and uh, you can calculate uh, really molecular weights. Uh, and, and the results are summarized here. So in blue, we see the protein alone. And now our ligands separate in two groups. We have um, the red ones uh, with a shorter linker where we see that the molecular weight doubles roughly. So obviously here um, uh, complexes with two proteins are formed, whereas here for the longer linkers, the molecular weight does not change. And from that, we can propose the following binding modes. So if we have a short central linker, obviously we obtain such two plus two complexes, whereas with a longer linker, we uh, obtain a one plus one complex in the way that we originally designed it also. Okay, so this is just a proposal. Uh, and how can we uh, further um, 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 yeah, solidify that? Um, so we used EPR spectroscopy that you can use to uh, measure distances between um, um, nitroxide spin labels. And we synthesized divalent, uh, tetravalent compounds, so these ILEX, where we attach two nitroxides at the outer ends. And if we now uh, um, uh, investigate the, the distance distribution that you obtain uh, with these Sorry ligands. Sorry to interrupt you, uh, Professor Whitman. Uh, please summarize because uh, it is uh, already uh, 12.30.
Yeah, okay. So um, I have just two more slides, if, if that is okay. Um, I, I just make it quickly. So if we um, have the ligands alone, we get a broad distance distribution. However, if we now add the protein, we see a, a big difference between the two ligands for the uh, for the um, along with the for the short linker, we still observe a quite diverse distance distribution. Whereas for the long linker, we just see a single distance. Yeah, and this um, is exactly the distance that we would expect if we um, um, uh, wrap around the ligand um, around the protein. Um, we can also do another analysis where we measure the number of interacting spins per nano object and we can also see a, a difference between the linker with the short with the, the, the ligands with the short linker and the long and so we see that indeed we have four um, spins per nano object for the short linker um, confirming that we have these two plus two complexes and we have just two uh, interacting spins for the longer linker where we have this one plus one complex. Okay, and that's the final slide. So we um, uh, can now uh, uh, interpret this experiment in the way that with the short linkers, we form these two plus two complexes. There is different arrangements possible and that leads to these different distances. Whereas for the longer link, uh, central linker, we obtain exactly the binding mode that we have designed. And here, that is the, the, the um, then we, we observe just a single distance between these uh, carbohydrate uh, residues um, at, at the outer end of the linker. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm at the end. I have shown you a new strategy that leads to uh, the ha very high affinity ligands that do not precipitate protein. I would like to thank all the co-workers involved. It was mainly the work of Philipp Rose in my group and Sabrina Weigert in uh, the group of our co uh, cooperation partner Malte Drescher. In the meantime, the, the topic was taken over by uh, Katharina Illenseer and um, Rebecca Meinusch. They are now the players in the field. Um, of course, I'm thankful for the funding agencies and I would like to finish with a picture of my group. And for all of you who do not know where Constance is located, I have a map here of Germany. Uh, that is Germany and Constance, in, Constance is in the very south uh, at the Swiss border close to Zurich. Uh, and yeah, with that, I would like to finish and I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. And um, yeah, uh, I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Professor Whitman, uh, uh, on this multivalent lecture.